I'd like to say a few words about some fundamental concepts in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, because Aristotle was the one who introduced the idea of the liberal education as opposed to the servile education. Servile as in befitting a slave, liberal befitting a free or liberated man. So education in that sense isn't mere training to perform a job. Instead, it is what suits someone who has the free time or leisure to be able to cultivate their mind. And in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle's purpose is to help us to understand and cultivate what a vision of a well-balanced and active and happy life really involves. And according to him, the main component of happiness is virtuous activity. And he sets forth a model of excellence, which holds that action is ultimately prompted by well-cultivated desire, guided by a variety of thinking skills. And those skills involve being able to discern sensitively what is appropriate for the given situation. The moral agent is then able to choose the appropriate means to the end, properly indicated by what the well-cultivated desire dictates. What does it mean to have moral character then? Aristotle's answer is interesting because he says that a moral character secures action from being derailed by fear or by the mere pursuit of pleasure. So a truly virtuous action is going to have the hallmark that the person performing it enjoys performing it just for the nobility or ethical beauty of the action. Although, of course, there can still be some pain in accomplishing a virtuous sacrifice. Aristotle sets out a vision of human nature to ground this framework in. He begins by saying that every kind of craft, he uses the word techni, meaning technique or skill or art or applied science. So any kind of systematic investigation that human beings undertake, every action, every choice aims at something. And his answer is that this something is some good. A shipbuilder, for example, aims at building a good ship. A military general aims at success in warfare. So he asks himself, is the good one or many? Or does it at least include many ends or goals? And obviously, the answer is many. Medicine aims at health. Household management aims at wealth. If we think about these examples, we can see that many ends are actually chosen for the sake of something else. You earn money, for example, to be able to spend it. But Aristotle thinks that there are some ends chosen for their own sake. He gives one example of doing your duty. But why is it necessary that there be at least some ends that aren't chosen simply as a means to something else, but chosen for themselves? Well, the answer, put simply, is that otherwise the process would be infinite, empty and pointless. If you only ever choose an end as a means to something else, then it continues ad infinitum. You ultimately never get what you aim at. He acknowledges that when it comes to thinking about ethics, we can't have the precision that we can in geometry. And the reason for that, he says, is that clarity has to ultimately accord with the subject matter. It's normal for people to disagree about what the noble and just things are, he says. So we have to admit of that in our discussion of them. So this implies that any discussion of ethical rules has to be a rough outline at best. He says, interestingly, that you have to live well to fully understand them. So you understand them better by actually performing them. And that actually accords with what he thinks a common definition of happiness is. Living well, acting well. And if you think about what kind of goods people often identify with happiness, some standard answers might be pleasure or wealth or honour. So if you live in a way that maximises pleasure, 
you're likely to be happy. If you maximize wealth, likely to be happy. Or if you maximize honor, at least that is the set of answers that Aristotle thinks you're most likely to get if you ask the man in the street. He acknowledges there are some thinkers, and Plato, his teacher, would be one of them, who think that the good is something else by itself that sits apart from good things. But ultimately, he thinks that we encounter the good in concrete form. It's not an abstraction in another realm. We can't really understand what proper upbringing or moral conduct is without ultimately living it, though. He doesn't think we can start from first principles because in some sense you already have to be a moral person to recognise the moral importance of the principles in discussion. So thinking about those answers then that you tend to get when you ask what happiness consists in, pleasure, wealth, honour. He thinks there are problems with each of them. Why is honour not the supreme good? Well, it seems that people are ultimately honoured for their virtue, not just the honour itself. But then why can't virtue itself be the supreme good? He thinks that if you're asleep, for example, you can't display it. There are also times at which it is inactive, you're not performing any virtuous actions. And it can also be marred by suffering too. It can be impossible to display your honour, your virtue. What about money then? Why can't money be the supreme good? The simple answer to that is that it's always a means. And then Aristotle sets aside for later examination in the Nicomachean Ethics the idea that perhaps the contemplative life might be the best life to live, the one most conducive to happiness. And that ultimately is the answer that he decides on, for reasons we'll come to later. We said a moment ago that he thinks that Plato's appeal to the good in itself and by itself is ultimately inadequate for anybody trying to get a grasp of how to live an ethical life. Remember that this is because it's ultimately not subject to action. No human being can possess it. He also thinks that the different things we call good differ in the respect in which they are goods. But the one thing that is always chosen as an end in itself and never as a means is happiness. So what does he ultimately mean by this? What constitutes happiness for a human being if it's not the pursuit of pleasure, honour, or wealth. And here is when we come back to his account of the ultimate purpose of education, the liberal education, that which befits a free man. He thinks that the key to happiness is cultivating what is highest in ourselves. And on his definition, human beings are rational animals. So we aren't angels, but neither are we beasts. We are part of the animal kingdom but distinguished from other animals by virtue of our rationality, our ability to understand. So the key to living a happy life, according to him, is to cultivate this capacity to understand. Now this entails the idea that there is a proper function of a human being. In much the same way, Aristotle says, as there is a proper function of a musical instrument. So the purpose of our minds is to understand, to reason. And the good of a human being is an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. That's what leads to a complete life. You do need some external goods for happiness. He says you need friends, you need family support, and it's useful to be not altogether ugly. But ultimately, for him... There's a big difference between happiness, as we use the term now in the contemporary sense of feeling good, and happiness in terms of what it means to him. Happiness as virtuous activity is something you perform, not merely something you feel. Now, it can be intrinsically enjoyable. In fact, Aristotle thinks that is the hallmark of a virtuous action. But it's not merely something you feel. It's not something passive. It shouldn't be regarded, he thinks, as a gift of the gods either. 
otherwise you're entrusting it to mere chance. Instead, it's a kind of stability. So the morally excellent person manifests this stability by always acting in accordance with virtue. Now we respond differently to virtue and happiness because none praise happiness the way they praise justice. The moral virtues, he thinks, are inferior to happiness because they are praiseworthy only in so far as they contribute to it. That's an important point. So the reason the moral values are valuable is that they help you to flourish in a lifestyle that will lead to happiness. He also points out that we feel within ourselves, within our souls, he uses that term, something else besides the rational part. The rational part is what he thinks is the highest part of the soul that needs to be cultivated in order for us to flourish as human beings. But he recognises that there are also impulses and the reality of self-restraint that show the soul is complex. It's not merely rational. So there are two kinds of virtue then, two kinds of excellence. There's moral and then intellectual virtue. Aristotle thinks that you can acquire intellectual virtue through teaching, but you can only acquire moral virtue. You can only shape and form your own character through right actions. Habitus, he terms it, taking pleasure in doing the right things. But what does it really mean to say that virtue is something we can only learn by doing? How is becoming an excellent person similar to becoming an excellent musician? The answer he gives is that interacting with other human beings is a kind of training in itself. So by having to make choices, by getting feedback from your interactions with the people around you, you learn by doing. There are two things that destroy virtue. Deficiency and excess. So this takes us into the idea that there are pleasures or pains that follow an act and that those are signs of an individual's character. Character can alter whether an action is pleasant or painful because it serves as a kind of moral indicator. The virtuous person is going to take pleasure in virtuous activity, whereas somebody who is habituated to vice, to acting incorrectly, who has built the wrong habits, is going to find virtuous actions painful. This is why he defines virtue as a disposition. So what we are likely to do, what we've been trained to do. And he also holds that continuing mental alertness is necessary. Virtue, in his famous definition, is a mean between extremes. To be angry, he says, is easy. What's difficult is to be angry with the right person in the right way and at the right time. Remember, at the start, Acting well was described as a kind of skill that you need training in. So what we need is the right feelings to the right degree, at the right times, about the right things, towards the right people, for the right end, and in the right way. Now obviously there are some things, Aristotle says, adultery, theft and murder, that are bad in themselves. Now virtue differs from simply avoiding such actions. Doing any of those things, whatever, is in error. There's no excess or deficiency. The middle term itself is an extreme. So someone who merely avoids murdering isn't virtuous. What's really interesting about his theory is that he suggests that through habit, we can ultimately change what we desire. We can educate our desires and feelings. So education isn't just aimed at the intellect and theoretical understanding. Instead, it's aimed at the whole human being. It's aimed at cultivating a desire for what is right. 